You're a leader in digital medicine. Uh, telemedicine has been uh, widely advocated as a tool to help contain the COVID uh, pandemic. Do you have thoughts on what should be done now? Uh, you mean in terms of telemedicine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we should, I, I, you know, I think this is a great example of, of, I wish we'd done some of these things before. You're a leader in this, Ray. You've been doing this. You've shown that people have, um, can, can talk to patients, can interact. I don't, I think we've really learned that the tools that we have, Skype, Zoom, the stuff that, that we're using, um, these tools have not honestly evolved very much. I mean, they're, they're, their bandwidth is there, um, but the bandwidth is not very good. It's kind of garbagey bandwidth. Um, you know, the, the biggest joke of the 21st century will be, can you hear me now? The Verizon guy saying, can you hear me now? Um, and and, and, it's, and it, it's, it's certainly an issue, but I, I, I think we haven't taken advantage of where we, in the 50s, you know, we, were, we started to think about video telephones. Um, and because these things weren't convenient, or maybe they're driven by the, maybe, maybe entirely by the sort of joy of the private sector, uh, that's not the way, that's not, by the, by the joy of the, the uh, consumer sector. Um, I don't think we've developed the tools as physicians that we really wish we had now. I, I think there are tremendous Internet of Things tools and tools that we could have um, that we could, we could see the patient, hear them better, hear better quality, look at voice analysis. There's a lot of information that we're leaving on the table. Um, and I think we've, I think we wasted, I mean, I'll be negative um, and then I'll be positive. I think we wasted 25 years. Um, waiting for the, asking the right questions and using those to drive the technology. Now we actually know what those questions are. How are you doing? How are you doing at home? I mean, how do I interact with you? How do I give you, how do I give you comfort? Um, that's still the most, you know, how does a doctor reach out and, 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 and grab someone by the shoulder and say, you'll be okay, or I'm here for you? Um, probably the most important thing that the doctor really does um, and yet we have not figured out how to do that and we haven't engaged that as a question. The tech is there, we haven't done it. Um, so I think the lesson from this, we'll never go back. We, we're, telemedicine is here to stay. Um, it's, going to, it's going to progress forward. I think now we understand what we need to do and I think, it's, I think the questions are gonna drive the tech. That's very exciting. I wish I was gonna work for 25 more years. I'm not, but I wish I was. So just on the care front, then we'll talk about how technology is transforming research. Uh, people say we're not going back. You know, all the changes that Medicare has adopted, CMS has put forth, are all temporary. Um, medical centers are losing a lot of money because a lot of patients aren't coming to the yeah. medical center. Uh, there'll probably be strong desire to return to the status quo pre-COVID. Why do you think? Why do you say we're not going back? And what's to ensure that we don't go back? Well, I'll tell you, the public and the patients will ensure that we don't go back. Um, I've, uh, I've, I, I'll be, I don't mean to be political, but what I'm going to say sounds a little political. There are two old 19th century industries that are still here in the 21st century. Um, academia, where people pay $75,000 a year to send their children to climb, uh, to climb uh, climbing walls, eat at salad bars, drink a little bit, and maybe attend a, a lecture or two and medicine, where we pile patients into waiting rooms and keep them waiting and really piss them off so that we can then see them on uh, you know, 20, 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour late. Um, I think that both of those um, fields, which are old school and, and driven very much, I mean, I'm an old academic, I'm a, I'm a, reta I'm a reformed academic, right? You're still, you're still the, you know, a real academic. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, medicine and education are transformed forever. Pe people have learned they don't have to learn at school. They don't have to go to the doctor. Um, they're going to demand that we figure out how to change. And if we're smart, both educators and, um, and doctors will figure out how to serve that market. So th I, we're not going back. We may want to go back. I, I, I promise you, your dean wants to go back for double reasons, um, because it's a great deal, um, but it's over. Uh, so at TED Talks, we like to think about how technology transforms care and research. We talked a little bit how technology can transform care. You've been doing a lot of work, uh, both as an academic and industry, about using technology to transform research and a lot of time and effort around digital sensors. Um, what do you think, what is the value for using digital sensors for measuring health and why is it important? Well, um, 
you know, I, again, I'm, I am, I, I, you'll never hear me say that the, that the role of the thinking, the thinking role of the physician, the thinking role of the person who understands medicine is always at the center. But the tools are really much, much better, especially in neurology, um, where we have, I mean, you can see behind me all the neurology books and all this sort of, all this sort of knowledge that we, that we have. Um, but a lot of it is, a, a lot of it is, um, it, it's not subjective in me, in, 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 it's not an attempt to be subjective. It's not like we guess at things. Neurologists are very careful about what they say they're examining, but we're not very good at it. Um, in fact, I'm going to do, I'm going to see if this works. We'll see if Zoom works. I'm going to share, I'm going to share this with you. I'm going to show you one thing. I'm going to show you the difference. So Parkinson's patient, um, Parkinson's disease, Ray, something. Can you see that? Did I, did I share that effectively? Um, you should see a picture there. So here's an example of a sensor um, of somebody who's doing a supination pronation task. Here's a normal person. And I'm, without going into the mathematics of that, we've just simply taken regular behaviors, Math, we've mathematized it, we've engineered it. And so here's a patient that's normal. This is what normal people look like when they turn. That's just, that's not multiple patients. That's just somebody turning their hand over back and forth, supination, pronation, whoops, for, uh, for, an, uh, for 15 seconds. Here's somebody, here's a patient. This patient has a, UP, a mild, very mild Parkinson's disease, but completely normal bradykinesia. I'm measuring bradykinesia here. And this is a patient with mild, mild to moderate Parkinson's disease. There's no question, I think, about the, um, no, let me see if I can get out of this. There's no question that we have a, we have tools at our hands. That's, those, are, so those, are, those are clinical research tools that we're now using to measure. You and I are using those, right? Those, that's what we're doing in the Watch PD study. Um, we have better tools. That's, that tool is, is 10,000 to 100,000 times more sensitive than you or I am, Ray, and you and I are well-trained. Um, and the fact of the matter is um, that's why we, we, we should use those tools for the same reason we have the Hubble telescope. Um, we have better ways of looking at things. We have better ways of being precise. And you can, and once you have more precision and more accuracy, um, and we can do them in, in, in real time, once you can do that, uh, we can apply tools um, that, uh, that, that actually allow us to be much more computational, mathematically intense. So um, the reason we should do it is it's better. It's more sensitive. It's going to, be, it's going to capture disease better. And it's going to capture therapeutics better. Um, anyway. I'll stop. You, men you mentioned that Biogen, the University of Rochester, and you and I are working on this Watch PD study, which is using the Apple Watch and sensors from APDM to get novel objective measures of uh, individuals with early untreated Parkinson's disease. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how these digital tools could be used for Alzheimer's disease? Well, in much the same way. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and I think this is one of the keys here, and I'll just I'll, I'll sort of talk a little bit about, about digital medicine. The important approach in digital medicine is to understand that you can use the engineering tools and the physics and the biophysics to look at the features of diseases, those things that actually characterize the disease. Um, and you can do that, you can do that from biological principles. You could do the same thing for the meaning of how, uh, uh, what a disease means to a patient. Uh, one of the things that people have, you know, so this is sort of, this is the sort of signal processing versus uh, machine language view. I'm, I'm going to answer your Alzheimer's question in just a second. Um, if I forget, you'll know that I need the drugs we have. Um, but the, um, but the fact of the matter is, is if you, if you try to identify, um, uh, sort of say, well, this person has this, and then you go search for features, the sort of, the sort of machine learning, um, unbiased view, you may not measure the right things. But if you know what you want to measure, um, and I'll just say you and I have had a conversation, what do you want to know about an Alzheimer's patient? You want to know, are they, are they able to do the things they were doing, they were doing before? Are they able to, do they stop making lists or are they improving the, the are they doing less list take, less, they're writing lists because they're forgetting? Um, are they actually, are they actually sleeping better? Are they less irritable? Those are the qualities, uh, those are the features of their life that, uh, that we need to be able to sense. If you just sort of say, I'm gonna sense a bunch of stuff and tie it together with somebody who has Alzheimer's, we're not gonna solve it. If on the other hand, we say, I know what those features are, I know what matters to the patient, how do I measure it? Now we have the tools to measure that, which means we can use the same principles that I just showed you when we're doing in Parkinson's and we can apply those to cognition. We have actually in Alzheimer's. We've done that for Alzheimer's for executive function and memory interactions in a very, very fast, easy way to test it that we've done um, on a, in a digital context. And so we can test the things that matter to the patient 
and that help us understand whether or not um, they're getting worse in terms of the, the context of their own lives. That's, that's really the advantage of the digital medicine, but you have to take it with a cardinal feature view, otherwise you get lost. Uh, so Parkinson's disease is the world's fastest growing brain disorder, affects a, a million Americans. Uh, number of people affected by the disease has more than doubled worldwide in the last 25 years. Alzheimer's disease affects five and a half million Americans. No highly effective treatments for a disease that affects five and a half million Americans. What features should we be measuring in Alzheimer's disease? Um, well, look, I mean, you, you, there's still a, there's, I think there's two pieces to this. One is, uh, one is going to be early diagnosis. Um, and so we're going to need to pay attention to, uh, speech and language, especially language. We're going to need to pay attention to people's, um, wayfinding. I mean, we, we know, we know what are the, are the early signs and we know, we actually know that well before a patient comes to the office or a family brings a patient to somebody to the office, um, that they're starting to manifest those, those, uh, those early signs. So there's two pieces. One is diagnosis and we need to, we need to make early diagnosis because the treatments we're doing are all disease modifying. Um, same issue for Parkinson's. I mean, you want to, you want to identify is the person developing those, those features first, but cognitive features, um, even more than motor features are manifested by how people interact with their environment. So how someone interacts with their environment, the time it takes them to interact, uh, to do something in their environment, those are the kinds of things we should measure. And, and so again, for the Alzheimer's patient, it's going to start with languages, it's going to start with memory, and it's going to start with way, the, their ability to find their way and with the executive function and the executive function cost of, uh, of overcoming uh, those, those kinds, of, those kinds of, of components. So dual task, dual task measurements, those, those are the kinds of things we ought to be measuring. Outstanding. Uh, we're gonna take questions from the audience in just a few minutes. Uh, clinical trials for almost every condition except COVID have essentially come to a pause or a halt, whether you have diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, uh, therapeutic development has pause has halted. Uh, is this the time for virtual clinical trial? Oh, first, I want to ask you, tell us what's happening at Biogen. Well, I, I mean, yeah, so the, the, um, the answer is Biogen, like everybody else, is, uh, is, 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 struggling, is struggling with this. Um, I think this is, the, this is the sort of thing we worry about. Uh, there's two things. One thing is you worry about the quality of data. Um, we want to make sure the data, the data which is being collected, is is still top, is still top quality. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll lose everything that went before. There's that's huge investments, investments for, for Biogen and, and other folks. Biogen has 50 or 70 clinical trials that are ongoing. Um, most people are sort of in an idling mode. There are some things you have to continue. I mean, some drugs you have to continue giving to patients, um, and so Biogen has been very focused on that in our clinical trials, as have others. Obviously, in the infectious side, I think people have been cautious about starting things that are immunomodulatory. So, um, you know, that, 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 that sort of slows that. Um, but the real problem is that uh, especially academic centers are, are having a hard time uh, seeing any, any patients in the clinical trial side. Um, some of the CROs are managing to, uh, to continue with that. So I think people are limping along. Um, I think that that's going to have to be something that soon after we take care of the ICU issue and, you know, and we're making sure that everybody is safe, um, I think we probably ought to turn our attention to making sure that the clinical trials pick up again because you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose the investment of the data. You've got thousands and thousands of clinical trials. If they stop and we, don't, we can't fill that data and we don't know how to do it, um, we're, um, that's a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of patient years that will be lost and a lot of effort that will be lost. That would be very unfortunate for patients. So, um, Biogen is, Biogen is doing, I think what everybody else is, they're trying to, they're trying to make sure that those patients who need drugs get drugs, that, uh, you maximize the folks that are in current trials. You pick the right trials to slow down that are, that cause the minimum disruption for the, again, for the patient. Um, and then you're careful about about new drugs that might, you know, the, the COVID and and uh, in, infection might might play a role in. So that's that's sort of where we are. I'll answer your virtual trial. So yeah, is it the right time for virtual trials? Sure, but not in the middle of virtu not in the middle of a trial. Um, again, it's an investment. You can't you can't you can't roll out you know trials and trials in 30, 30, 50 countries with five hundred sites. 
you can't change you can't change the trial in the middle. First of all, the FDA would not tolerate it. even this FDA, which is more, um, I think, much more. It's on their, their war footing is more interested in maintaining safety, and you know we'll figure out the efficacy. But the truth is, you can't. You, you, good science doesn't allow you to make too many changes mid strike. But going forward it's time to really think about what do we do with virtual trials? We, again, we need to not, we need to not lose the opportunity to prepare for the future. Um, any virtual trials that Biogen's playing that you want to discuss? Um, well, there's a couple of, so again, we're, we've been working for, a, a, working for a number of years. Um, the, um, our global clinical operations team has been working on a, on a work stream for a number of years called um, Tech Enabled Clinical Trials. We work with them in our group. There's actually a very interesting, we're doing some interesting work uh, in Wyoming. Wyoming has a very forward looking uh, sort of health system that they take their ruralness and say, what an interesting, you know, what an interesting opportunity to do experiments. So we're working there to see how, um, how distance, which is of course insurmountable, so you, you, you have to solve it, how distance can be used to sort of drive um, clinical trial tools forward. To run a clinical trial, virtual clinical trial is easy to say, it's very hard to do. Um, and so there's a lot of learning and a lot of work. So that's sort of where Biogen is. It's, it's really trying to understand the details necessary to, um, to build that infrastructure, to be able to roll it out in a, in a, uh, in a, in a uh, relatively serious way. It'll be different for each kind of trial. So we're not there yet, but, um, but we're building the infrastructure. I know we have some questions that we want to take from listeners, and then uh, I'll have a couple of questions to wrap up. Uh, Abby, you want to tell us uh, questions for uh, Dr. Burgerthon? Yes, we've had a couple questions roll in from the audience, and feel free to add yours in the Q&A section as well. Uh, the first is Dr. Burgathon. Do you see telemetry finally being integrated into televisits per your comment about the need for improvement? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I, uh, Ray, Ray said what's really important is people have to, but, well, look, you have to figure out how to bill for this stuff. Um, one of the things that's important to re remember is somebody still has to build the infrastructure, somebody has to run it, somebody has to take the notes, and somebody has to pay the doctors and nurses that are doing the work. Um, and so um, that perha perhaps there's a business innovation piece there. Um, but I think that, I think there's no going back on this. They, we, we, the technology is there, people are gonna to wanna to use it. And the smartest thing to do would be to figure out very, very quickly how in a regulated environment, which medicine is, um, how you ensure privacy, how you ensure safety, how you ensure quality information. Um, but I, I do think it's, it really is time to move forward in, in, in those areas. Uh, but they're, they're, they're actually not technical problems. They're largely social business and, uh, and legal slash regulatory problems. A lot having to do with privacy. It'd be very different in America where people are much, much more open than in Europe where the governments protect against the sort of the fear of, of loss of privacy. Uh, but you got to deal with both. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, it is predictable that teleconsultations will be made available by specialized centers also to patients who live beyond their catchment areas. How do you best prepare these new patients and families to interact with a totally new medical team? Um, they asked if you could comment on the role of pre-visit instructions, review of systems questionnaires, and or ad hoc questionnaires. Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. I think the art, the art of taking the history um, is, is, is one of going to be an area that, that I, I'm not sure we know how to deal with yet. Um, in a lot of ways, people have stopped taking history, so it can only be an improvement. Um, but the review of systems, the, the, a good, a good uh, you know, HPI and, and a good, the, the conversation, that conversation, especially for the neurologist, um, is critical. Um, you gain a lot of information there. Uh, I don't think we know, honestly, and that's an area that, that we ought to pay a lot of research attention to, and, and, and there needs to be some art. Um, I'm going I'm to make, make a pitch for Ray. I think the kind of work that Ray is doing and, and the, um, you know, the center there is doing is thinking about those questions, but it really is an important, it really is important to figure out what can you ask somebody 
I think maybe avatars might actually be more useful than we can imagine. Um, it goes back to my original roots of building intelligent machines that actually interact with people creatively. Uh, maybe there's, maybe this is the area that, that uh, maybe that's what I should return to is go back to what I started with. Um, but I think that that human touch, that ability to get a story told draws information from the patient and questionnaires don't always capture that. There, there, there's something unique about the interactivity that doesn't mean we couldn't do that with tech, but, the, but that technology hasn't really been developed yet. Not well enough anyway. Abby, maybe one more question. Sure. Uh, we have a little bit more of a personal question, which was, what was it like to have so many senior biogen leaders sick at the same time? How did you keep the company going? Um, well, I, so I'm not important enough to, um, to be able to actually speak to that uh, very well. Um, I think that, you know, I was lucky. I, I was lucky and I think a lot of folks were as well. I was able to work through most of it. I spent more time staring at walls than I should, but I was able to function. Um, I think probably it's always very humbling to senior leadership when they find out that companies run just fine without them. Um, so I, I would say that uh, a, a big dose of humility went with uh, with being with being home, um, but you know a lot of people stepped up, and and I think that's the other thing that's important is that is that a company like Biogen, most companies, most 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 academic organizations, most people, you know, that people step up to what they need to do, and, and when when someone is when someone who's a little older and a little more senior, a little more experienced is is uh, maybe is ill. Um, there's almost always a ring of folks that are ready to step, you know, that step into that role. And that's what happened to Biogen. So um, a good, a good team and lots of people who, uh, lots of people who were able to, uh, to step into role. Um, and then truly I wasn't that important. So it didn't, and now some of the others may have been very, much more important than I, uh, maybe they weren't, they weren't sick, but, uh, but I think Biogen was, was able to pull it off mainly through the team effect. So Peter, you're one of the founders of Digital Medicine. You've been a student, a practitioner, and a leader in the field for 40 years. Uh, what advice do you have for drug developers thinking about digital studies or digital measures? I think it's. I think the most important thing is just do it. It's just like Nike. Um, we we need to we need we need to do it. We need to do it rigorously. So I, so let me say, do it, but do it carefully and do it well. Don't reach for the next shiny object stay focused on fundamental fundamental medicine fundamental physics fundamental engineering that guides us and then know what your question is i think the most important thing that hasn't changed that hasn't changed in in decades what's the question how do i answer it how do i compute it how do i be rigorous if we do that and then just don't be afraid to ask the impertinent question so that it's the same as it's always been but ask the impertinent question be rigorous in its, its answer and it's time, there's no excuse, it's time. Uh, so the last thing we're gonna talk about, a little personal touch, you, you clearly like books. Uh, you have a personal tie to Parkinson's disease. I think your father had Parkinson's disease. I know you're reading a shameless plug for our book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, which just uh, came, came out. I also understand that you really like uh, science fiction. Uh, so do you have any thoughts or predictions for the future, short-term or long-term? Um, you want a science prediction or a science fiction prediction? Um, I, um, I will, I, yeah, so I will predict, I am going to predict that this COVID virus, like the plague, is going to, is going to crack the 20th century. I think we actually leave it behind. Um, interestingly enough, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not post-apocalyptic. Um, in, in my in my science fiction view, I'm much more much more the Asimov sort of Heinlein kind of kind of uh, person, but I actually think we're going to enter a period of, of enormous um, individual individual sort of taking a, taking responsibility using technology. But I think the reversal that we'll see over for the last twenty or thirty years is we're going to see we're going to see people working in communities together a lot better. I think the science fiction part will be not how technology tears us apart, but how it brings us together, um, how it makes us sort of um, join together around that digital uh, campfire. Um, I think we're going to see that. That's reversed of almost every science fiction view you'll see. It's not post-apocalyptic. I think it's very hopeful. 
Well, thank you for joining this digital campfire and for our first uh, Chet Talks uh, presentation. Our next one is scheduled for uh, next Tuesday, April 7th at 12 noon. We'll be speaking to Dr. Ernesto Ramirez, who's a senior data scientist at Evidation. He and his colleagues conducted the first large scale study examining physical activity among 150,000 individuals in response to the COVID pandemic. The results are not good. Uh, until then, the Center of Health and Technology and the University of Rochester, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you again, Peter.